dear Vladimir. Mr. Chancellor, Mayor, President, Madam Ambassador to the United States, distinguished guests. It is with great satisfaction that I have accepted Vladimir Klitschko's offer to give a laudatory speech for the Ukrainian nation, honored by the hosts of today's ceremony. As a Pole, as a friend and ally of Ukraine from the very first days of its independence, as a committed European and man of the West, the West, in the sense of political values, I have a duty today and a right to speak with force and unambiguously about the heroic fight of Ukraine, about Russia's crimes committed every single day of this war, about the stand of Europe, and about the meaning of this war for the future of all of us, from Kiev to Lisbon, for our freedom and our security. As Timothy Snyder noted, quote, this war will establish principles of politics and geopolitics for most probably the whole 21st century and may also decide about the fate of democracy as such." Unquote. Today we pay tribute to heroic Ukraine, not only deeply moved by its suffering and courage, but also fully aware of the stakes of this war for all of us. These stakes are so high that we must discuss our role in this historic confrontation with complete honesty. Ukraine, as recent days have proved, has a chance to win this war, but it needs a decidedly greater support from the side of Europe, in particular from the side of the biggest and richest states, like Germany. And we are not talking here only about symbolic support, about awards and distinctions, but about weapons, ammunition, planes, tanks. There is no, I underline absolutely no reason that Germany, France or Italy be less engaged in helping Ukraine than the United States, Poland, or the Baltic states. Putin has attacked Ukraine. But in fact, this is an attack on the whole democratic international community. Only the political blind men can today be denying the fact that Russia, by different means, has been waging war against NATO and the European Union for a long time now. Weakening of the North Atlantic Alliance, interfering in elections and also in social conflicts in the EU and also in the US 
involvement in Brexit. These are all examples of Russian political sabotage on a great scale. Breaking up of EU's unity is no doubt one of Kremlin's obvious priorities. Therefore, politically, we have no alternative but to univocally engage ourselves on the side of Ukraine. In a moral dimension, the situation is even more clear. There hasn't been in a long time such a black and white conflict where the boundary between good and evil is so sharply delineated. It is evident who the victim is and who the executioner. And any attempts to relativize this issue seem to me, bluntly speaking, disgusting. European politicians all over the continent, also here in Berlin, who are looking for some kind of symmetry for some historical and economic justifications for their inaction or neutrality. They should be aware that if the assistance from all of the Western countries, especially when it comes to weapons, was quicker and greater, Fewer children would have been killed in Ukraine. Fewer women raped and murdered. Fewer towns, hospitals, and kindergartens bombarded. When I hear today the words that Europe and Germany should have listened to Poland or the Baltic states, about Kremlin's aggressive politics already many years ago. I feel, unfortunately, bitter satisfaction. Yes, we were right when we urged you back in 2008. Back then, I was the prime minister of the Polish government to agree for Ukraine to join NATO. We were right when we were warning against the catastrophic geopolitical consequences of Nord Stream 2. Or when I tried in 2014, after the first uh, uh, Russia's attack on Ukraine, to bring the Germans, the French and Italians around to the idea of the energy union um, in Europe and Europe's independence from Russia's gas dictate. Uh, but we cannot turn back the time. So let's do whatever can be done and let's do it now. These are an immediate increase in weapons deliveries, including heavy weapons, to Ukraine. Political guarantees for Ukraine's full membership in the European Union as quickly as possible right after the end of the war. Let us return to the question of Ukraine's membership in NATO and real security guarantees for Kiev for the future. Let us maintain a full unity of the European Union, the United States, NATO, in our tough sanctions policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia.
There have been voices coming recently, also here from your country, that Germans cannot openly side with Ukraine because of the memory, memory of Russian victims from the time of World War II. When in fact, the Second World War began with an attack of Germany and Stalinist Russia on Poland. And the greatest sacrifice in that war was made by the Polish, the Belarusian, the Ukrainian nations, and of course, the Jewish population that lived in these territories. If the feeling of guilt and responsibility for the Second World War should oblige Germans to anything today, it should be first and foremost a univocal and full engagement on the side of Ukraine's fight against the aggressor. And a serious and honest stance regarding compensation for damages for the nations that paid the highest price for the folly of Nazism. I'm saying these words as a politician who has been engaged in the process of Polish-German conciliation and in the building of common Europe for many years, not as an enemy, of course. All the arguments, moral, political, historical, and civilizational ones, bid us to stand today on the side of Ukraine and its heroic defenders. I am, I will tell you from my heart personally, I'm very proud of my compatriots who have demonstrated to the whole world from the very first days how to behave in the face of such a historic challenge. And I am also very proud that today I am surrounded by, by people of goodwill who are all saying today, with no exception, Slava Ukraini.